Friday, October 2nd, 2021. This is The Better Life. I'm your host, Timothy Lawson. Living a better life means recording your monologue just before you run to the airport so you can put it all together, possibly when you're at the airport or when you're on the flight. It's been a busy week. Uh, I was hoping to get this out yesterday, and uh, I had a big list of things I needed to get done yesterday before I left. Putting out this podcast was literally the last thing, and I decided to, I was like, God, let me just, uh, I'm just going to go to bed so I can get a little bit of sleep, and then I will uh, put it all together uh, in the morning. So um, as I'm literally leaving for the airport in seven minutes, I'm recording this monologue just so I can save it and then bounce and then uh, putting the podcast together uh, and putting in the feed uh, as I depart for Las Vegas Nevada. Um, I will talk about uh, a little bit more on what I think my agenda is going to look like after the interview. This week's interview is with Alex Christensen. Alex uh, does a number of things. I'm, uh, I, I list them in my interview uh, with him, but uh, I know him from his daily contribution to Brown Bag Bets with Andy Molitor. I met him at Bet Bash, and um, I knew he was a sports better. And then when we were talking, and he mentioned that he uh, likes to wander over to the roulette table, I thought, ah, you might be, uh, you might be one of us. Uh, and so I invited him to come on. And we had a great conversation um, about uh, about being uh, a, a sports better that that looks at many sports. Uh, some of his favorite things to do in the casino, uh, his favorite spots in Vegas. We talk about content creation, all this sort of stuff. So uh, I think you're going to enjoy this one. Alex Christensen. Enjoy. Alex Christensen, who hosts uh, a number of things. I originally heard you on Brown Bag Bets that you do with Ali Motter. You're also a part of Eat Sleep Tennis, Net Worth Pod, uh, and writer for 4 for 4 Football, Ace NBA Previews, all this sort of stuff. I mean, you're everywhere, man. Do you, ever, do you ever get, like, exhausted? Like, do you ever, like, do you ever just, like, man, I can't say or write any more than I have? I would say the last month or so of the NBA regular season last year took every ounce of physical and mental strength I had to get through. It was such a tough season. Um, I think I ended up grinding out a small profit from, you know, regular season bets outside of doing like quarter props and things like that. But that was one of the first times in a while. And then the very first time I actually tried to get into content in a very deep way. I thought for a little while I would try to write a preview of every single tennis match every day. And this lasted about six terrible weeks. Um, if you go to my profile at underscore noobs, you can see a link to a little chart and you can find very uh, far there over on the left. It's like a March to April kind of thing. It just, the line drops kind of straight down and turns out it wasn't very good. I was a very convincing writer, I guess, talking myself and all sorts of stuff I shouldn't have done. <laughs> but outside of those two times, you know, it, it can be tough from time to time. I find days where I kind of have to turn everything off, try to, you know, focus, but as you do this stuff more and more often, it becomes a bigger part of your life. You kind of learn how to schedule around it like anything else. So it's right. not too bad and you have to plan for it. But from time to time, it gets to you. Very good. Well, uh, I have a bunch to ask you regarding uh, content and um, sort of that experience as both being a better and a content creator. But first, the rite of passage to the better life, Alex. We need to know who you are as a better. Can you can you remember the first time you were exposed to gambling, at least an early recollection of you sort of being in the presence of it, whether it was family members playing poker, maybe you maybe took a trip to the dog track, whatever it may be. What was your first recollection of gambling? Uh, you know, I thought about this question a little bit because we actually we talked about this when we met at Bet Bash, and it's kind of a twofold memory. I can't remember which happened first. I grew up in a big card playing family. My grandma, uh, Norma Jean Christensen Sullivan, if you've heard of her and you happen to live in the Southeast Pennsylvania area, she's kind of a bridge shark and has been for a long period of her life. She was a second grade school teacher for a while and kind of retired and became a bridge shark. My dad, you know, growing up, didn't allow us to have video games, thought it was very um, unproductive, would uninstall them on our computers. We never had a gaming system, but he played hearts on his computer all the time to the point where, you know, he would run into certain points of the algorithm, as he would call it, designed to screw him. You know, at some point, you know, you got to have bad cards and you lose every once in a while. But, uh, you know, so I grew up in a big card family. We played poker quite a bit. I remember playing poker for quarters or chips or something like that when I was growing up. 
And then the second thing was horse racing. You know, one of the big events in our house growing up was watching the Kentucky Derby. Every year we would watch the Kentucky Derby. We'd watch the Preakness. We'd watch the Belmont Stakes. You know, so I don't remember anybody ever betting on that. But of course, the betting lines are up and we talk about that a little bit. That was probably my first exposure to actual betting odds, whereas playing cards is probably the first time I ever had actual money down. And like, so d- d- how did you, can you remember at any point in your life, can you identify a moment where you start realizing that you're taking to it, right? That the, that the, that betting is uh, intriguing you. Uh, playing cards. I got really big into playing poker for a while. I didn't quite get totally swept up in the internet poker boom. I wonder what would have happened if I had taken that more seriously. Um, it just struck me at kind of a poor time in my life to be focused on something like that. I was right in college and focused on different things. But um, I think that was really the first thing. Playing cards with my friends, I realized that I was a much better card player than they were, not only in just kind of reading them, but also understanding the situations. Um you know, after kind of reading a little bit about poker, what I realized was my big edge was I was the first person to understand the value of being, you know, last to bet and things like that. So I could kind of Mm. bully my friends around that way. Cards was the first time I think it really realized to me that I liked betting per se, but I think the transition to sports happened, um, you know, slowly and kind of tough really as i think a lot of us have here in the united states growing up you know i was born in 1988 i'm 33 years old you know a child a classic child of the 90s if you will i grew up watching rugrats and doug on nickelodeon and perfect all of us i think at some point got subjected to fantasy football and fantasy football was that thing where you could play fantasy football you know don't bet on football don't talk about betting in football especially if we're at work but we could play fantasy football and of course people kind of know there's probably some money involved but we don't really talk about that and you kind of make the transition from that to i know a lot about football and all of a sudden I'm in college and there's someone willing to take a bet for me. And you start to put some stuff down like that. And after being kind of a bad college football better and a bad NFL better for a little while, started to work on it and work on it and actually made the transition into betting on tennis. Um, You know, the more and more I started to learn from others, listen to podcasts, you know, specifically the deep dive with my friends, Drew Dinsick and Andy Molitor. They were really great in helping me not only understand how to be a good handicapper, but to understand what I was really doing at, at the time was poor made the transition to betting tennis just simply because it seemed really interesting to me. Tennis is 11 months a year, about 24 hours a day. It was something I could constantly be doing and not a lot of people bet into it. So it was a little bit of a a less efficient market that it was a little bit easier for me to attack. And at the same time, there's, there's a couple really good um, data resources and things like that kind of put it all together. And I dove, you know, headfirst into tennis, started the net worth podcast with my friend spread Astaire and um, John formerly known as Jorge. Um, we talk weekly about tennis and outrights and things like that. And, you know, that, that moment when I was, you know, kind of sitting at work and I would have my tennis model open and minimized um, with some other work files going on, trying to figure out who was coming around the corner, working on tennis while I was probably supposed to be doing other things. So, <laughs> uh, you know, start with fantasy football. You kind of go from there. You're a bad, better. But yeah, I think tennis is the first time it really grabbed hold in a very serious way. Yeah. OK. What, so. Uh, t- so I, I appreciate your uh, enjoyment of tennis because uh, um uh, just a few things that you mentioned there is a lot, a lot of the reason why I enjoy soccer. Do you enjoy tennis as a sport or did you quickly pick it up? Like, did you notice that it's just a good betting vehicle and that's what got you into it? I think that getting into it definitely was more around watching it. So I had some of some smart people that were betting tennis. I was kind of doing the thing you do when you get on Twitter at first, and you're trying to figure this out. You just tail people's picks. You're tailing them. I'm watching a little bit of tennis and It really is a fantastic watch, especially I like the women's game more than the men's game. At the end of the day, and apologies to anyone that thinks it's sexist, a tennis net is an exact same height, whether it's the women's or the men's. The men tend to be taller, which means they can serve better. They have more power. And just having that extra couple inches, whether it be, you know, being six feet versus five, eight, you know, that's a huge difference in terms of trying to hit it over the net. And what it means in terms of the style, the men's game can be a little more straightforward. The server has a bigger advantage, whereas, you know, women, it's more about being a little more creative. You see more creativity, I think, in the women's game because the serves aren't as good. There's a lot more returns. And I describe tennis, if I had to compare it to a sport, it's a lot like boxing. 
Um, you have that sort of one-on-one -on -one approach to it. You have that kind of feel of rounds, the way the games go. Um, you know, they're not throwing punches at each other, but they are hitting the ball back and forth at each other. They're trying to get each other to fall over and move around the court and stuff. There's a lot of positioning. Um, and, you know, the women's game, I would say, is more like watching, say, like a really good lower weight fight where watching a good men's match can be a lot like watching the heavyweights. It just depends what you like. So watching a lot of tennis, getting into that, and then, you know, the combination of liking watching it. And the unique thing about tennis is it's a closed scoring system. Because you're playing to a certain number, there's a limited amount of outcomes in a tennis yeah. match, specifically in certain situations. It's one of the most unique things about tennis and one of the things that is someone that is kind of a puzzle person is a little bit of a numbers person really just got into my brain was something I thought about a lot and I stumbled into correlated tennis parlays you know I, a lot of people have the story the first thing that they stumbled into that they probably should have bet more money on I had a book that was letting me parlay the tennis favorite spread with the under and if you're not a tennis better you know for example let's say a tennis match finishes six four six four you know what you had there was the total of 20 six plus four plus six plus four equals 20 games and a spread of four. So the favorite covered four. So, you know, for example, I could go in and bet a favorite, say to cover like a six spread, a spread of six games and under 18, knowing that I think the math at that point on six and 18 and a half was something like 90% of the time someone's covers the six and goes under 18 and a half, but they were giving me straight parlay odds and stuff like that. So all that kind of stuff was just a really good sort of first spike and to try to take this more seriously and, and feeling excited about it. What were, who were some, like, who were you following? What types of content were you consuming around this time? Were you, when you're trying to improve yourself as a better? I think that you have to read books. And I hate to say that because I'm someone that's been quoted several times as saying books have too many words. Uh, they almost always do. It's very frustrating for me that you have to do this, but there's a <laughs> lot of really great books out there, both informational, both kind of anecdotal, you know, um, I'm struggling to remember his name, the bookmaker from South Point, Chris um, Andrews, Chris Andrews book, once upon a time in Vegas, you know, dot, 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 40 years of being a bookmaker, something like that. Make sure you get that. It's a fantastic read. It really will get you kind of excited about the idea of sports betting. Not only that, it can be done in a way that's profitable, but gets you kind of excited. You, you learn little wrinkles and things like that. But you also want to look for really technical books. Um, you know, as I start to think of some things, Andrew Max, you know, statistical sports modeling in Excel, um, I know is probably one of the more boring titles that you'll ever see. And there's someone, again, that doesn't love reading books. That was a little tough, but it shows you a lot of things, whether you're an Excel user or not, there's a lot of strategy in there. And then starting to read things that, you know, kind of are a step back from sports betting, you know, things about probability. Joseph Buchdahl has a handful of books that are really good. Um, Nassim uh, Talib, I can't remember his first name. He does a very good job writing about things like that. Black Swan is a really interesting book to kind of get your mind around the concept of probability, because at the end of the day, sports betting is about understanding variance, understanding probability, you know, being able to look at a situation and, and kind of see what's at work there. Um, Nudge is another really good book. It's written by a few economists and it kind of helps you unpack the way that people see things and the way you can sort of nudge people in directions and how you're nudged in certain directions. So you know, get into that, read a lot of books about different things and don't just read books about what you're trying to handicap. Um, I try to read poker books. I read Omaha poker books. And again, I'm mostly a sports handicapper, but just to try to get a flavor, a little bit of other things. So uh, I think reading again, helps a lot. Um, you've got to listen to a lot of podcasts. There are some really good ones out there. You know, again, I mentioned the deep dive with my buddies, Drew and Andrew. That's really good. The bet stamp guys. Um, I think that circles off podcast. You know, the Rufus Peabody and Jeff Ma podcast at the process is really good. There's a ton of, of really good stuff out there. And you know, I, I won't list everything, but as you start to listen to those, you'll get the feel of that. It'll help you understand kind of what's good and what's bad, which can be really tough, but doing that. And then as you know, Tim, I'm sure, you know, get out there and meet people, get on Twitter, get on Instagram, go to different events, talk to people. Um, it's amazing how much you learn, not just listening to people talk to each other and asking questions, but it's also incredible how much this community is willing to help people that, you know, show an aptitude and a will to, um, you know, put in the effort. Yeah, 
I, absolutely. I, uh, I echo um, all of those content recommendations. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, you're constantly a student, right. Of this, there is no, you hit no, you don't hit a moment where you're just like, okay, now, now that I've learned everything, I can start applying. You have, you continuously have to, um, you know, I, you still hear fundamental things, uh, that where it's like, oh, I think I, I guess I've always known that, but I guess I don't apply that as much as I should, you know? And so, um, yes, yes. Yeah. It's stuff like that, that, um, you know, always comes through, uh, no matter it's how also, much. It's also big about doing the application. Um, like you said, you know, even if you could get to a point where you knew everything, I think if you waited that long, you still wouldn't know enough. Right. I've never met a successful better or successful person in this industry that didn't have a period where they were losing for a little while while they learned. I think you really do have to pay your tuition. So, you know, start small, Start with some fake numbers, but at some point, unless you're really putting your own money down, whether it even be five, 10, 15, 25 bucks, it, it becomes a lot more serious and different. So make sure you're always learning, like you said, but you got to be trying stuff. Uh, so you're primarily known for sports betting, handicapping sports betting. Uh, but as you mentioned, while we were at Bet Bash, you can find yourself playing a casino game from time to time. Uh, what, uh, what, what game, what table games around the casino catch your attention? Well, I, I tried to start as I think a lot of people, um, like myself uh, who like cards, but don't necessarily want to go sit at a poker room. You know, poker rooms are great, but they're tough to find. And, um, you kind of sometimes walk into other people's games, but you know, if I'm walking around the floor, I love Pi Gal. It can be tough to get seats at Pi Gal for whatever reason. I guess everybody knows that it's like a solid game to play, but I love that, especially if you're lucky enough to get a chance to play it face up. Um, I don't play the bonuses. I mean, if everybody's playing like the one for a dollar, maybe, but um, I like playing Pi Gal. I'm a huge fan of roulette. I can't walk into a casino without playing roulette for a little while. Um, <laughs> and craps is something I picked up over the last year that um, I'm taking an affinity to more than I probably would like. <laughs> Well, uh, I I like to hear that uh, with a bunch of crafts enthusiasts uh, in this audience. So uh, we understand that draw and uh, can appreciate that there's uh, another uh, another fan uh, being created. What are your what are your numbers at the roulette table? So what I like to do is buy sections of the wheel. Um, generally, what I'll do is on your kind of standard zero double zero wheel where the zeros are on the other side, I will play zero double zero one two um, 13 14 23 24 35 and 36 they're all kind of lined up next to each other i generally like the idea that for some reason if they were going to tilt wheels wouldn't they tilt it more towards zero i'm sure they don't but you have to have some <laughs> sort of insanity to your roulette theory because yes as i like to remind myself all the time there are 35 i'm sorry there are 36 numbers there um you know, maybe they'll pay me 47, 34. Maybe they'll pay me 35 if I'm lucky. I'm sorry, there are 38 numbers there. Maybe I'll get 35. Anyway, yeah, I like to play those. And then, you know what? If there's a hot number on the board, I'm a sucker. If, if it's hit two or three times, right. there's a couple numbers that are near each other. I'll start to chase those. You know, depends what the table's doing, right? You got to go with the energy. Absolutely. And if you're not, if you're not superstitious at the roulette table, you're not playing it right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You got to have a feeling, you know, if somebody walks over there with a ton of chips and they have been sitting there for a while and they slap them all on a number, you better put some on top. You better be cornering the sides of that thing. <laughs> you have to, you got to do it. You have to, you have to. What, uh, what are some of your favorite places uh, in Vegas? What are your, some of your favorite casinos? So I generally, um, I like to be downtown. I like to be as close to Circa as I can be. I think that's really my favorite place, not only to bet sports, but to hang out and gamble. You know, that floor just above the sports book is really nice. It has a lot of space. Um, you know, places like Resorts Casino are probably a little bigger, a little more plush, but I really like being close to Circa. So I generally stay down there. I like being at the Plaza if I can rent a car because, you know, they have the garage down there and that's very convenient. But I love downtown. You walk down Fremont Street, you always see something interesting. It's always very easy to get a pina colada, which is very important for me. Um, so I generally <laughs> will stay down there. Maybe, you know, if, if things go well or poorly, if you will, at a particular place on the Strip, I'll stay there for a night if they will give me one for free or pretty cheap um and 
you know, being on this trip's really fun. I love the Cosmo. I don't know how I feel about the way it's getting broken up. I hope that, you know, they try to keep that, the, the look and the feel of that place the same because it, it's really a special place. One of my favorite places to be. Um, I still like Circus Circus, as sad as it can be from time to time. At some point, you're still there. You can sit at a table and you watch a show. You pick your head up. There's some sort of acrobat flipping up doing like 20 different things. And there is an odd but interesting feeling of having kids in the casino. Um, it's just an interesting place and I like it. And I would hope somebody would take care of it. But, you know, I love going there. And then, you know, it's not a casino, but if you ever have a chance to go to the Pinball Hall of Fame, it's basically this big warehouse full of pinball machines. That is quite a bit of fun to spend, you know, an hour or two in the afternoon if you need a break, say, from the lights of a casino and want to see the lights of a pinball machine. <laughs> yeah, because if there's anything that'll help cure the lights of the casino, it's the flashing lights of a pinball machine. It's uh, a little darker. It is a little quieter. Yeah. There's no smoking, which is nice. Yeah uh very good well so um i always enjoy talking to uh, content creators um in uh, in the gambling space especially sports betting uh because um you know just the, the the lens in which we see things and the sort of the effort that goes into creating content is a little bit different than simply being a better and, and consuming things i get i get in no particular order i have a handful of questions the first one being you pump out you're a part of so many different outlets and uh, and programs uh, that cross multiple different sports. I mean, how do you how do you remain confident that you're keeping up with as much as you need to 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 be to be able to produce that kind of content? Um, a lot of it is having really good help. Um, you know, as someone that is, you know, kind of had his hand in, in working on a lot of shows and being on a lot of shows, I don't think, I think it's really difficult to do it alone. Um, you know, you listen to a lot of people that create content. It is generally part of a group. You know, writing's a little bit different. Um, so, you know, I'm talking mostly here about like a sort of podcast and creating video content. Uh, writing is something you can do by yourself. And I think, that writing more than really any of the other stuff, you have to really take a lot of thought and practice about how you're going to do it. You know, are you going to write before you make bets? Or are you going to write after you make bets? Um, you know, how are you going to write? Can you build yourself a process where it's repeatable and consistent? I, th I think that stuff's really important. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I tried writing up tennis matches every day and I just had a bad process and it went poorly. You know, now I'm writing MBA regularly and that's gone pretty well. But, you know, when it gets to creating content from a video perspective, from a podcast perspective, and you know, even from writing, really, it helps to have a group. It helps to be working with several people because you know there's always going to be an idea there and as tough as it can be to come up with things the beautiful things about sports betting is I'm, I'm sure you know and everybody listening knows there's something every day there literally isn't one single day of the year that there isn't something going on so you know if you have somebody that you're working with you can kind of um you know mesh and cover bases you know one of the things i like working with andy molitor on brown bag bets is he likes certain college things. I generally take to more pro things. Again, college basketball is his. He takes, I take NBA. He's big in golf. And then we kind of fill in the gaps with, with other people along the way. Um, you know, when I look at um, some of my other stuff that's a little more specialized, I guess that's the other way to go about it. You know, try to find your niche. My goal at some point, whether people care or not, is to create the world's greatest tennis podcast or the world's greatest tennis show. Again, I don't know if anybody will watch or listen, but damn it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, and it's find something that you're passionate about and, and make sure you just get into a good rhythm about it. I think um, if you are passionate about it, if, if, if it's something you're kind of meant to do, the ideas come um, because you're betting every day. You're doing a lot of this stuff every day. So um, you find you're talking with people about it every day. So you're constantly finding ways to kind of adjust it and um, hopefully think of ways to turn it into interesting segments on shows. Um, so, you know, well, one, I think you can very easily have the um, best, you know, tennis program out there. And even if only X amount of people listen to it, those X amount of people will be listening to it because it's the best one available, right? Um, there's there's a niche target, there's a niche audience um, for every niche topic, um, and you know there's there's a really great um, uh, there's really great article like kk.com. It's like a, it's called a thousand true fans, and it's just mm -hmm. the it's the idea that it doesn't you know like everybody wants to have like this huge you know following or um, you know they want to be able to you know they, they want huge numbers. 
No, if you if you can find a thousand people to commit to you and your products, you're gonna do you're gonna do pretty good, right? If you if you have a thousand people that legitimately are bought into what you and what you're doing, um, you're doing well. And it's I've I've used that sentiment to keep myself um to you know to limit my expectations and not get disappointed when I feel like my you know things are plateauing or I'm not uh you know I'm not getting numbers I know other people's are etc. Yeah, and there's a lot of different reasons to create content too. I mean, people always think about trying to grow a following, um, you know, try to earn a living, if you will, creating content. But, you know, one of the reasons I did it early on was to help from a networking perspective. Basically, the Network podcast starts because I harass, spread, and John every single day about tennis. And they're like, we're going to have a podcast. And I was like, well, I could host a podcast. I'd never hosted anything before. I just, you know, had the rational confidence of somebody that might be able to do that. And it I kind of went from there. And it was a vehicle for me to learn more about tennis, to kind of be, you know, part of their everyday process. Um, and I got a chance to meet a bunch of people from that. So, you know, it's not only a chance to help yourself grow in something and learn in it, but at the same time also to make bigger connections. So, you know, one of the reasons I love doing brown bag bets is because we get to have guys like Chris Felica on, we get to have guys like Jeff Goodman on. And it's just, you know, if I didn't create content, I wouldn't have an opportunity to do stuff like that. So getting a lot of people to watch and things like that is always very interesting, but there's a lot of other utility for content outside of, you know, just growing a following. Have you have you found yourself uh, look? It's just you and me. It's just you and me here. No one else is listening. Um, have you <laughs> have you ever found yourself get too cute on a bet for the sake of content? Maybe not, not for the sake of content, but like you like something about a game, and so you start putting some things. You start like doing some research, start looking into it, and you like because you are preparing content, you're seeing more or you're finding more data, nuance, narrative, et cetera, that you almost discover another bet that you otherwise wouldn't have, whether or not that's the better play or not, but you find yourself betting it because you've kind of, you've gotten there because you've spent so much time researching that particular match or game. Does that question make sense? Yeah, it's just kind of two parts to it. I mean, in the first part is, you know, you're creating content. Do you ever kind of put something out there that maybe you're 50, 50 on? I, I try not to. Um, and if I do, it'll be something I'll mention it kind of as fun or as a, as a smaller play. It, it is something you have to be really careful of. You know, I talked earlier about as you're creating content, especially if you're previewing things and talking about bets, making sure that you understand your process is either content then the bet or bet then content. So the two aren't necessarily influencing each other. And the second question, you know, being kind of as you're doing it, do you, do you, you know, does that help you find things? Do you stumble upon stuff you probably wouldn't normally found? And, and the answer to that, of course, is yes. I mean, anytime you're spending more time doing something, you'll get better at it. And um, I would say oftentimes Andy and I'll be sitting talking about something before a show and we'll stumble into something that we like. Um, we'll be talking about something on a show or after the show, unfortunately, after we've already um, wasted our opportunity to share it with everybody, we'll figure something out. But yeah, the more time you do that, and that is one of the utilities of creating content. It forces you to keep thinking about this stuff. The more you think about anything, the better you'll be at it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, do you find that when you're actually watching the sport or when you're, um, you know, you, you, got, you got bets on this tennis match or that, that uh, football game, whatever it may be, do you ever find that, you know, because you are so, like, are you constantly in the state of evaluating things for the sake of your output? Does, does, that, make, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think the answer to that question is, Yes, for certain sports, no, for other sports. You know, whenever I'm thinking about tennis, whenever I'm talking about tennis, whenever I'm watching tennis, it's always through the, the guys, through the eyes, uh, through the glasses of how can I use this to, you know, make my model better, to make my selections better, to avoid losses, to find more wins. Um, you know, things like the NFL. Um, NFL is probably semi serious for me, if you will. I take things like first touchdown score very seriously. So whenever I'm talking football, I'm always kind of listening for little nuggets on that. But I stay away from some of the bigger markets there. And there is some kind of fun stuff. You know, there is definitely some degen bets on NFL every Sunday morning. So, um, <laughs> To the degree that I take the sport seriously or I take the betting practice seriously, that's probably the same degree to which I'm constantly taking in information, you know, again, through the glasses of, through the assumption of trying to get better at that. So 
something that I, you know, um, something I hear from a lot of sports bettors, um, whether they're content creators who also bet and make picks or they're professional bettors who occasionally allude to what they're on, what, on whether when they're on, like a guest or they have their own platform is this like the stark difference between how they feel about losing a bet versus how they feel about knowing that people followed a bet that lost. How does like, how does that, does that impact you? Like you, do you find yourself getting like nervous or, or just generally like, I think it's difficult that if you know that people are following your action and you have a bad week, I, I think it's human to be bothered by that. What is your experience with that? So I think one of the advantages to my experience is I've never charged anybody for my picks. Um, so I think that takes a lot of guilt out of it for me. At the end of the day, as long as I'm putting out picks that I feel confident in myself and I'm putting out picks that I bet myself, how could I feel bad You know, if, if people lose worse necessarily than I feel that, that if I lose? You know, If there does happen to be someone that makes a mistake and puts too much money on something and I hear about it, that obviously makes me feel bad. Um, I would always, of course, rather win for people than lose. But I think in general, if you're someone that is really overreacting to individual losses, this isn't something you should be doing. Mm. So I think a lot of the stuff that I get from people, oh, I can't believe it. Oh, my God, you lost four picks in a row. You're a complete waste. I can't believe I lost all that money. Like, you shouldn't be on Twitter following the advice of strangers. Like, yeah. I know that I make shows, but I am a stranger on the Internet. Like, And I know it's 2021, <laughs> but I'm a stranger on the Internet. Um it's going to happen. And if you are betting for a long time, there are losing streaks. Again, if you go to my Twitter profile at underscore noobs and look at that link, there's a lot of ups and there's a lot of downs and some are long and some are short. And, and that's how it goes. If, if you are again, overreacting to losses, this is not for you. So I, I try to keep that in the back of my mind, but uh, you know, of course you feel bad from time to time. If you hear about people, you know, who maybe put a little too much money on it or, you know, just started following you as you go kind of over seven for the week or something like that. Yeah. What made you decide to, to add that layer of transparency? People annoying me. Um, <laughs> you know, I had a log. I, I kept track of all my picks. I, you know, I think that's the most important piece of advice I could give to someone that's betting at any level, whether you want to be serious about it or you don't. Keep track of the amount of money that you spend. How much money did I spend? When did I spend it? Where was I? What did I put it on? As you get more serious, it'll get more complicated. But you do need to track what's going on. Um, just to keep yourself in control, to help yourself understand what you're good at, to help yourself understand what you're bad at. And, you know, that was stuff that I always did, but I assure you that the, the spreadsheet didn't look as nice as it does now and wasn't as complex or diverse and all the nice pretty outputs that it does now. But as someone that decided to put myself out there on the internet, share my picks so that, again, I can grow my network, meet people, get a little more connected, build a little more respect amongst the smart group of people that I'm lucky enough to be a part of, you lose along the way and people find you and are particularly annoyed at you about that. So as a response to that from time to time, there's a couple of people who like to go in and say, oh, it's lost like his last 12 picks. And it's like, no, I won three of my last 12 picks. See, right. as weird as it sounds, it makes me feel a little better. Right. <laughs> That's what I like. Well, maybe, but I have won two of my last two. So hey, I didn't uh, lose all of them. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, tell us, tell us about, um, have you ever had a, like, uh, like we, we've all had losses before. Um, uh, can you, can you recall a loss that like made you, uh, like they kind of shook your world a little bit where like, you're like, uh, like where maybe you uh, overextended yourself into a play or uh, maybe you uh, maybe it can't come to the tail end of a bad week, like where, where the negative variance or, or a bad loss, like kind of like has you a little, like, like it, it felt different than most losses. I would say, you know, so there's kind of two bad losses. Number one, you bet too much money on something that you thought was too good. And it didn't work out. Um, the latest version of that was a bet on South Alabama in college football, um, a particularly smart gentleman and a handful of particularly smart gentlemen stacked hands and, and basically were like, this is going to be the biggest bet we've made in the last five years. And you hear something like that and you get kind of excited and maybe you tell some people about it and you ask them to do some stuff for you and you kind of take some money and, you know, 
I bet more on this than I certainly should have. I didn't bet more than I could have. Again, you got to make sure uh, as part of the tracking thing, you got to make sure you, you, you kind of know what you're getting into, but um, it didn't go very well. They were uh, 14 point favorites. They won by three. Um, they were down at halftime. It was just generally really bad. Um, and that one was tough, you know, kind of moving around, moving stuff after that. I had to cash out a little more Bitcoin than I had planned on doing that particular month. Although given how that went, it turned out maybe that wasn't the worst idea in the world. Right. And then the, and then the most painful variance loss was a Portland Trailblazers team total over 117 and a half. It might've been 118 and a half. If I'm being perfectly honest, I'm pretty sure it was 117 and a half because they had 117 points and there was about a minute and a half, almost two minutes left in the game. With 40 seconds left, about 30 seconds left, Dave Lillard gets fouled and goes to the line to shoot two free throws. Dave Lillard was one of the greatest free throws, not only in the NBA today, but in the history of the NBA. He makes about 90-some uh, percent of his free throws. He misses both. Um, the game sits at 117. They go up and down the floor. The Trailblazers have the ball for one last possession. They should dribble the clock out. For some reason, the guy turns and at, just as the buzzer goes off, fires up a shot. I can't tell if it's before the buzzer. I can't tell it's after the buzzer. They put the points on the board, as I'm sure you figured out by now, based on where the story is going, what I'm talking about. They go to commercial, they come back, and the final score is Portland Trailblazers 117. Somebody else, something else, because I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> really, 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 really got to me. Um, that was one of the more tragic losses. And I mean, I had a pretty spectacular season overall last year in terms of bad losses. I went back and looked. I lost um, something like high 60s, low 70% of my totals losses were in games where, um, or, or losses in general were on teams where the team I bet on um, shot less than 25% from three-point land and the team that I bet against shot uh, more than 45% from three-point land. So a lot of that, I set a record personally for losses on totals by one basket or less. Uh, it was an interesting wow. NBA season. Maybe the whole NBA season will be my answer to that. But yeah, uh, Dame Lillard missing two free throws, the buzzer beater being taken away after the commercial break at like what was one in the morning, I'm sure at that point, uh, will live with me forever. Yeah. Um, if you if you had to strip away everything and you could only bet one sport for, uh, from now until you're done betting on sports, what sport would you stick with? That's really tough. Um Tennis, probably. Okay. It's between tennis and NBA basketball. I should probably say basketball because it's a wider answer. I could I could handicap more stuff technically, but that feels like cheating. Um, it would be WTA tennis or the NBA. It would probably be tennis. Um, I like the day to day of it. It's a little more interesting to me, and to be honest, it's a less efficient market. So yeah, women's tennis. Okay. Is there a sport that you don't currently bet that has caught your eye? You just haven't been able to sort of fit it into your, your flow yet. Yeah. I, I always look, think about handicapping golf every year, but I'm lucky enough to have a couple friends. Again, my buddy, Andy Molitor from Brown bag bets, um, James Mazzola. He's at JMAS. He has uh, the four profit podcast, which is really great. Um, and then my friend uh, link Calhoun or Calhoun link. I forget which Twitter handle he's on uh, the world's greatest golf town. Um, I'm lucky enough to be friends with the three of them and they do such a good job at handicapping golf. I always think I'll just let them do that. I haven't handicapped WNBA yet. I'd like to get into that a little bit. Um, and then I'm always curious about fighting, but my big struggle as a sports handicapper, especially with boxing, UFC and things like that. I can't knowingly have my money on a sport where it comes down to judges who have arguably the worst view of what's going on of anyone on planet earth. Yeah. How, how, how dumb is that? Right? Like, how, how is that still how that works? It, it blows my mind. Every time there's a big fight, it comes back. Someone, someone's upset. So like any, one of the sports shows that I listen to, will talk about how the, how one or more of the judges got it wrong and talk about this, you know, situation where how the judges don't have the, don't have a great view. How's that still a thing? Right? Like it, it blows my mind. So which is dumber, um, judges of sports having terrible seats? I'm fine with judges if, like, they sat on top or something or, like, had TVs in front of them. 
or the fact that human beings call balls and strikes in baseball. Arguably yeah. the single most important thing in baseball games is decided by an old man wearing a mask, standing behind a guy in a mask. <laughs> and, you know, everything that we know about the human being eye and the fact that we're really bad at figuring out stuff as it's coming at us or going away from us, there's just... There's too much at work for me. I mean, there, we, I, we, you know, we need umpires. I, I don't know if you could figure out, you know, safe and out calls, especially stuff like that. But balls and strikes, there should be a green light. And if you want the guy, there's a little thing in his ear and it goes, hey, ball, strike, whatever. Let's move on with our life. It's just insane that every ump has their own strike zone. And that's a thing. Yeah. The just officiating in general, obviously, is, um, you know, I, I, I think it was one of the, one of the sports books, uh, Twitter handles yesterday, I think it was FanDuel or was like, what, you know, um, name the greatest rivalry in, uh, in sports. And I was like, sports betters versus, uh, their bets, <laughs> right. Like versus or versus the teams they're they're supporting. But I think it's probably the bigger, the even bigger than that inside that joke is sports betters versus officiating because sports betters are, most sports bettors are smart enough, I think, to admit, okay, I got away with one there. We know when we've been fortunate, right? We know when oh, yeah. officiating goes our way. But it, I mean, when when one call or more calls like go like really are what's screwing up a bet, it, it it's one of the, like if you got a game wrong in how you thought the game state was gonna be, whatever, whatever it may be, you're just like, okay, I got this one wrong. But if you got it right, and the only thing that's jacking it up is poor officiating, it like it makes me wonder why I even bother. This happens at least ten times a year when I watch the NFL. I'm like, why do I do this? Why do I bet on the NFL? <laughs> like, why? There's there's plenty of second and third tier soccer for me to bet on today. Why did I choose to bet on the NFL? Another reason tennis is great. They have an automatic review system. A little computer yeah. says, "Up, oh, the ball went right there." They move on with their lives. That's a gr- I mean, yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Th- that's Takes a night. Like 20 seconds. That's amazing. That's definitely uh, a little the- TV right there in the court. Everybody sees it. It's like, oh, there's the ball. Did it hit the lot? Oh, no. Oh, it did. Perfect. And we move on like adults in 2021. Describe your, describe your, your ideal betting situation scenario whether you've whether you've experienced this yet or just something you've like always dreamed of like where are you what are you doing what's happening what are you drinking like give us the give like like try do as much as you can to describe what that looks like when alan christensen is like just in his best gambling moments yeah i I try to think i guess i'll start with stuff that i've experienced and kind of figure out what the ultimate answer is as as i talk through it I, i think that I really love the, the beginning of tennis majors. Um, and it's really nice sometimes like the U S open specifically can coincide with football season where I can do the thing that I love doing. I'll go Sunday, hang out with my friends. I'm in a fantasy football league of 14 guys, the moisture meter uh, company. And um, we've been playing fantasy football. I guess we're, this is probably our ninth or 10th season. I'll go hang out with a bunch of those guys on s- Sunday, set up a laptop, hang out with those guys. I've got all my football bets going. I'm kind of helping them do stuff. We're doing fantasy stuff and roll that into like a grand slam Monday where it's tennis from 10 AM in the morning to the absolute end of the night. Um, I'm getting a chance to watch that You know, go back home. I have a really nice setup on my couch, put up a couple monitors again, have a few laptops, um, things like that. So, you know, being with your friends, watching football is great. Being at home, kind of getting all the tennis at once. I'll say probably the best in my casino experience I've ever had. That one's really tough. I've had a couple that were pretty good watching basketball games. Um, last time I was there, I watched a um, the U.S. Open women's final at 5 30 6 o'clock in the morning vegas time at circa with like 10 people that was actually kind of fun um but you know if i had to really do an ultimate thing again it's it's tough to kind of keep talking about circa here and unfortunately i don't know if you're sponsored by them you should be they're great circa <laughs> we would love your sponsorship uh haven't had a chance to go up to stadium swim and kind of do a, a week one nfl weekend there um, looking forward to hopefully doing that next year with a lot of the crew from bed i know they do that every year so something like that would be pretty great I, but i haven't really i don't think committed myself to like even just a sportsbook experience for a full afternoon i've done a couple games that's always quite a bit of fun but Honestly, yeah, I think the ultimate experience is just being with some friends, whether it be at a casino, whether it be kind of hanging out at somebody's house, um, 
you know, having again, whatever it is you want to drink. I'm a liquor guy. I like a cocktail. If we ever meet, we'll have Negronis. They're spectacular. Perfect. Um, and just kind of sit back and enjoy and stuff. So, yeah, I think it's a lot about who you have around you. But I think yeah, the ultimate thing would probably be doing a, a week one NFL weekend at, at uh, Stadium Swim. Uh, Spanky announced Bet Bash 2 first weekend of April for the final four weekend in the NCAA championship. Um, will I see you there? I hope so. I haven't bought my tickets yet. It's a particularly odd weekend from a family perspective, but I think I could make it work and I really would like to be there. The first bet bash was pretty solid, although I wasn't feeling 100% myself. You know, I won't be going out and playing golf and not drinking enough water and getting heat exhaustion before bet bash this time. So that'll make it generally a little better experience. But yeah, I'd love to be there. Uh, my hope is to be there even for a couple of days hanging out if, if I can't make the whole thing, but it really does sound like a great experience. And again, it's, you know, whatever you think about Spanky, positive or negative, it's an opportunity to be around a lot of people that like betting, that like betting on sports, which means it's an opportunity for meet people to know stuff that you don't know, whether they're smarter than you, whether they're dumber than you, everybody knows something you don't know. So go out there, be nice to everybody, take out the opportunity to kind of learn and meet some people and you'll be amazed at how much easier this gets, the better your network gets. Yeah, very good. Um, well, I, I hope to see you there, Alex. This has been this has been a pleasure uh, sitting down talking to you about sports betting, casino gaming, um, cro- content creation. We covered a lot of uh, a lot of things that I, I, I very much enjoy. Um, people can find you. I'm not going to list all the things that you do again, um, but I will say that people can <laughs> find you at underscore noops. Uh, yes. Yeah, tell, give me, give me, give me the uh, backstory if you if you can, if you if you care to on uh, on the nickname Noops. So I have grown up near or in Philadelphia. I am 33 years old. The furthest away from Philadelphia I've ever lived is Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which um, people know that's where the Amish are. Um, that's about an hour and 15 minutes. You can do a little bit less to Philadelphia. I am a huge 76ers fan. Um, I gave up sports fandom for the most part. I can't seem to quit the Sixers. Um, I grew up as a Temple Owls fan. I got out of that when John Chaney um, shifted out, grew up as a huge Penn State fan. So you grow up, you're a Sixers fan. Clarence Weatherspoon, you know, before Allen Iverson, there was unfortunately just Clarence Weatherspoon. The, the history of being a Philadelphia sports fan is generally sadness with occasional moments of joy. Um, and I was a big Clarence Weatherspoon fan, you know, going to high school, um, loved playing basketball, mentioned that I was a Clarence Weatherspoon fan. And for some reason, they started calling me Spoon. And this incredibly lame thing carried into college because you do those two truths and a lie. And my two truths would be I play basketball. People call me spoon and my lie would be that I play baseball. I'm about a six foot tall white guy. I look like I play baseball. And of course, no one would ever believe anyone would call anyone spoon. And that kind of stuck. So, you know, if you went to college with me at LaSalle for four years, you know me as Spoon. Um, You know, I get into kind of the Twitter space. There are lots of spoons. So why not flip it backwards? I see. Very good. Um, well, I, I try to catch brown bag bets, uh, each day, um, when I can, um, I love listening to you and Andy, uh, it's, it's just nice to get a quick injection of, of sports betting, right? Just, it's, uh, here's what we're looking at. Here's what we've made everybody. Good luck. Um, and so I do enjoy that program. I recommend that to, uh, to everybody listening. And I, I hope that you and I get a chance to, uh, pay, maybe play some roulette at Circa, uh, during, uh, bet bash two in April. I look forward to it. Maybe if we'll try to hide some earpieces in and we'll, uh, live do a live show of us playing roulette and being hopefully happy. Perfect. Alex, thank you so much for your time, man. Take care. Thanks, Tim. Big thanks to Alex again for joining me. A lot of fun ha- doing that one. Hope to see him and many others at bet bash two in April. I'm in Vegas. Good chance by a chance by the time you're listening to this. I've already been in Vegas. I don't know. I'm probably actually still in Vegas by many, by the time many of you've listened to this. Um, if you're listening to this sort of day of next day and you're lying, you're one of those people wondering what my agenda looks like. Uh, I get in mid Saturday. I'm hanging out at the plaza for um, for a couple days, for a few days, I should say. Um, uh, I'm ha- I'm gonna have reasonable nights, and so uh, not burning the midnight oil, but um, reasonable nights. But otherwise, um, I am going to just be around downtown, likely with Mark Duvall, who's also 
driving out to to come hang out in Vegas. Apparently, there's about a dozen other people I know that are going to be in Vegas. Not just uh, you wonderful listeners and community members out there, but I know Julian from Vegas Confessions. There's a bunch. Of, there's a vlogging meetup. There's all sorts of people. So I am looking forward to seeing who I might run into. But uh, I will be tweeting out where I am when I'm in a situation where people can come join me. And I kind of anticipate being around long enough for someone to see the tweet and make the decision to, to come down and uh, and join us. So I'm hoping table minimums and table openings will be kind enough uh, to allow that. But uh, we shall see. Sounds like it's going to be a busy, busy weekend uh, in Vegas. And then there's G2E, which I'm very much looking forward to, um, to see what's going on in the gaming industry uh, a couple years after this event last uh, was put on. And uh, yeah, follow me on Instagram at The Better Life. Be- stay tuned here on the feed uh, and hopefully at YouTube, youtube.com slash The Better Life uh, is where I hope to be pumping out a bunch of content. Um, okay, I, I'm going to go. <laughs> I literally have to, <laughs> I was thinking of other things I should say here, but uh, yeah, I should probably wrap this up so I can uh, go catch my flight. Zorkfest in December, M- more things about that soon. Probably going to probably gonna have a little segment with Michael Traeger uh, coming up in um, uh, either, not this coming week, but probably the, the week after uh, to really get into, uh, into Zorkfest to, um, to, to, educate and sort of excite people on on what it is in case anybody's been on the fence uh hopefully you guys can come hang out with us december 17 18 uh zork fest it'll be at the plaza it's gonna be a lot of fun okay i gotta go i got a flight to catch on behalf of alice christensen i am timothy lawson good night good luck <laughs>